Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Just Two Dads with my co-host and my partner, Mr. Sean Francis. I am Brian Altunian, and uh, I've got a great conversation. No guest today. Today, we are going to be talking about uh, what's on everybody's mind right now, which is the economy and the impact that it has on special needs families. So um, it's going to be a great conversation. We've got a lot of stuff. It's going to be very informational, I think somewhat educational, um, maybe a little inspirational. I feel like a I feel like a Kenan Thompson kind of. Anyways, uh, this will be another great episode of Just Do Dads. Oh, see, I didn't hear the music again. It's so weird. Hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Just Do Dads. I am Brian Altunian, along with Sean Francis, my colleague, my business partner, uh, my friend, and uh, and my co-host, and uh, my family, Mr. Sean Francis. I want to thank everybody for joining us on Facebook Live. Um, uh, we do this every Wednesday. We've been doing this for over two years now. We've got over 100 episodes in, and we're, we're, we feel like we're just getting started, partially because it feels like we're just getting started. Um, we do this live on, on Facebook. If you're catching us after the fact on our YouTube channel at Just Two Dads, um, hopefully you'll hit the subscribe button and uh, like, comment. We do read all the comments. If you're catching us on podcast outlets. Welcome, everybody. We looking forward to um, to your comments as well. You can reach out to us uh, via our email at we are just two dads, all one word. We are just two dads at gmail.com. And uh, for those listening in the U.S. Virgin Islands, we're also on WSTX AM radio down in the U.S. Virgin Islands. So we want to welcome everybody. Before I before I forget, also just so you know, folks understand, we don't we do this just the two of us. We're just two dads having a conversation, but we could not do this without the help and the support um, and the prodding of our of our good friend and our producer of the podcast, Mr. Sean Hall, who is in Hawaii. Um, Sean controls, uh, I don't know if Sean controls anything, actually. He basically tells us to do stuff, and sometimes we listen to him. Um, but uh, <laughs> but he is, he's, really, he's, he's really a third dad in this conversation and, and, and part of the special needs community um, by association as well. So um, thank you, Sean, all for all the work that you do. We love you and, um, and uh, honor you. Thank you for, for supporting us here and all this. Every week we pick a topic or we have a guest that we interview. Our goal in this podcast had been to shine the spotlight on those that were, um, that had, a, that had a, a, an experience or an encounter or have a relationship with the special needs community and have taken what they know, what they've learned and applied it to serve the special needs community. So we wanted, I've always wanted to shine the spotlight. We've got a couple of guests coming up in the next few weeks that are going to be really fascinating. Sometimes we have, I guess sometimes the two of us just want to have a conversation about things that are on our, you know, on our mind or in the, in the forefront or things that we know that are impacting special needs families. And today's topic is something that we have, um, you're, if you're reading a newspaper or watching the news, some people have, by the way, have given up both and that's okay, but yep. you're, you're, you're seeing it when you go to the grocery store, you're seeing it when you go get gas, uh, the impact of, you know, economic factors, um, uh, you put that in the private chat, by the way, Sean. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> you're seeing that on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, and so the economy, the impact of the economy and what's happening. By the way, what, we're, what we've just been through through the pandemic, what we're going through currently, and what we're still going to be going through over the next several years uh, is going to impact all of us, every family, but special needs families who rely on services, who rely on support, who rely on, you know, other folks for to to you know to help uh and that all of these things have a financial impact it really strikes home and and people seem to forget it's it's almost like it's a forgotten community and yet here's the crazy thing about it at some point in our lives we are all going to be members of the special needs community we're going to need help we're going to need support and so so this while we while we focus on those that are dealing with special needs issues medically complex issues um challenges some would say disabilities um, the reality is we're all going to, we're all going to have some special needs at some point down the road. So everything we talk about generally has an, has an impact. So I want to thank you for joining us. Please comment. We read all the comments. Um, sometimes we re respond in the right area. Sometimes we, we, we forget what we're, what we're doing because technologically we're, we're challenged. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but we're doing our best. So without Speak further for ado, yourself. Uh, I am a technological I'm not, ace. I'm not sure that word means what you think it means, but, um, but Sean Francis <laughs> 
I did a lot of rambling there. Um, uh, I love that we're having this conversation today. So tell me, give me, tell everybody, first of all, how, you know, how are you feeling in general? And I know, I know, I know you're a blessed soul. So, um, but in general, how is this impacting you? How is this, you know, give us, give, give us a little you know, insight um, into Sean Francis. I'm doing great. Glad to be here. I just appreciate the platform that we have. Um, you know, we have been very, very blessed. Um, you know, we've had, I'll say that, I, I, you, that your challenges are gifts in crappy packaging, you know. Um, and for us, you know, we had a, a leak in one of our uh, bathrooms, came into the kitchen and everything. The bathroom has been repaired and remodeled. The kitchen has been demoed. We've been without it for a while. But throughout it, we've had a lot of, you know, um, uh, benefits that have come from some of the challenges. Now, the appreciation for cooking food in the kitchen as opposed to eating out as much as we uh, as we have been is really deep. Can't wait for that to be finished so we can do that. And when you think, talk about the economic piece, you know, the other day my wife was telling me, actually yesterday, that um, our, you know, the, the eggs that we get would probably limit them to the, uh, the warehouse stores as opposed to the grocery store. Um, you know, when I don't get them from my neighbor who happens to have, you know, ample hens and roosters. But the, I think it was like, I think it was like $10 for like a regular, regular pack of like, you know, carton of eggs, you know, like mm. world type prices and things like that. Um, and if you haven't been really, really squeezed, you can tend to forget and you observe from a distance, oh, Things are costing a little more. Things are costing a lot more, ridiculously. And for those that join us often, they know that you know you and I met um, getting into the financial services um, uh, services um, industry together. And as a result, you know, deciding that we wanted to bring um, build a bridge between the special needs community and financial service education and opportunity. So that's why we're going to talk about those things today and uh, where things are at. Uh, at the pump, you know, I'm going to mention a couple of things here today. There's some things that uh, in terms of concepts that we'll touch on that we utilize in the families that, that we help and serve. And if there's any way that we can help somebody or guide them, that's great. But we're not here to sell our services today. Matter of fact, there's a couple of things that I'm going to mention, at least one or two that are money saving um, opportunities uh, or uh, even apps that are out there. And they are they're not paying us to do it, but it puts money in my pocket. So I figured I, you know, I. We'll share that. But, um, you know, you talk about the services that people, you know, get and receive. You know, the, the big thing, the, the biggest impact that we've seen, I think, is on on uh, with groceries. And it's interesting because um, the the uh, rate of, um, you know, inflation was probably pre-pandemic, I think, what, but somewhere between 5 6%, somewhere around there. Well, stated, stated, pre-pandemic, the stated – um, inflation number was about three to three and a half percent stated. Right. So it's right. three to three and a half. And and so what's happened for us is since it's taken place, our business has completely gone to Zoom. We do the show online. And as a result, I'm not driving as much, you know, with, you know, work, but you know, you're still feeling it when you go to the pump. And here in California, where we are, more so than any place else. Um, sure. what, what about you? What about yourself? Because your situation well, is different that your daughter's not here and she's an adult. Right. So, yeah. So, so, so a few things. I still have a, I still have a 15 year old son that I, that I have to drive to, uh, baseball practice and baseball games. And, you know, we're, so, so the driving mm -hmm. thing hasn't changed much, but, but, but a couple of things for, uh, for, first of all, I, I definitely feel, feel the impact, um, um, and, and there are there are apps, and we definitely we should talk about some of these. I think these are kind of cool. Let's just in general. So we'll talk about the economy. So here's what the thing that people have to remember: it's it's easy easy to jump on current political conversations and and the and the impact of the economy. Um, the reality is that there are certain things that our policymakers can do that they can where they can have a hand in it, and there are certain areas where they don't. If anybody believes that um, that our administration, current or or previous, had any impact on gas prices, you, you're you're forgetting the some of the major you know the major factors. 
the gas gasoline prices are controlled by corporations. Corporations set their gas prices. Now, governments can state governments can put taxes on it that would make a gallon, you know, a gallon price higher than in other states. Um, the administration could have an impact in in in, in um, foreign policy as it relates to the OPEC countries, the oil producing countries. But the reality is, it's it's nearly impossible for an administration of, of again of any political party to actually impact the day to day pricing on gasoline. It just doesn't it doesn't exist. Um, what impacts pricing more than anything is is production. And so when OPEC decides to cut production, which by the way. A week ago, they did. They decided to cut production by a significant amount, hundreds of barrels, hundreds of, uh, sorry, hundreds of thousands of barrels uh, a day. Like they have really like changed the oil production, which impacts prices. Um, now, some people say, well, we had a pipeline planned to go from, you know, Canada through the, through the country. And we didn't do that. Can, couldn't we have done that? It doesn't really yes it may have had it may have had some impact we may have been able to add to add jobs but the other thing about it is we're trying as not just as a nation but as a as a global effort to reduce our independence on fossil fuels reduce our independence on on oil to run our vehicles to you know to power our engines that's also one of the reasons why opec <laughs> cut its budget in a way it's a little bit of a retaliatory a little bit of retaliatory action to say, oh, you guys want to be on, you know, you want to be on the electric vehicles and, and, and you know, get away from oil dependency. OK, well, I guess we should cut mm -hmm. production during the pandemic. By the way, people were not driving. They were not going anywhere. So the cut in production actually made sense because there was a there was a there was a cut in demand. Now that the pandemic right. is over, people are trying to return back to work and things have changed. Now there's an increase in demand. And so the way to keep prices up when there's an increase in demand is to cut production. So. Um, Anyways, there, there's a lot of stuff that happens to impact the price of gasoline. And by the way, the price of gasoline changes how we tran how we transfer our our uh, products from the ports uh, via trucks. How we you know how we how we handle shipping of our in the supply chain. And so, gas and oil prices that fluctuation does impact other areas of our economy. So. When the gas and, and oil prices change and, and they go up, it does impact all the other things, especially when there are already shortages, high demand, you know, certain other economic factors that impact. So I feel it at the pump. I know you feel at the pump. Luckily, I have a couple of I have a couple of apps that help me find the lowest cost, uh, the lowest cost gasoline in the area that I'm in. There's one called, yeah, by the way, we don't get paid anything by any of these companies to promote. So we're not promoting this for any reason other than just to let you know. There's one that I have called Gas Buddy. Gas Buddy is great. You can click on it and say, where's the nearest gas in my area? They do a little reward thing. So if you report local gas prices, if you're at the gas station, like, hey, you said it was you know, 685 and it's only 645 and you put that in there, they give you a little incentive. They give you a discount mm -hmm. on prices. There's another one called Upside. Upside's a great app. Um, uh, so there's Gas Buddy, there's Upside. Upside will show you not only gasoline, but also restaurants and. I wanted to say that. I was going to say that's, uh, you know, I first heard about it specifically as it relates to gasoline. And I, when I found out that there's restaurants involved, I, you know, we've used it when it comes to restaurants and then we've used it for gas. And when you, ref, when you refer someone um, and they use it for the first time, there's a certain amount that you get off your next gas purchase as well. So what it does is it you when when you have the location um, services on on your phone, it'll tell you what gas stations are in your area. And again, this is just something that we treat this as we do the actual business that that we do. We're we're our own clients as well with their company. So the thing is like, hey, yeah. if 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 you go any place and have a good experience, especially if you paid a dollar for that experience, it's almost your moral responsibility to share that with other people. So that's all that we're doing here. Yeah. And by the way, like I I, I will tell you, I didn't use I didn't use upside this morning. I, I had to take my daughter to to the airport. We can talk about it here in a second. I think I paid six forty five a gallon in Los Angeles. And that was on the cheaper side. And now I just opened up upside because we're having the conversation here. And I'm finding one that if I'd used upside in a, in a place not that far from where I am right now, I would have paid 577 saving 22 cents a gallon. 
you know, if you put 10 gallons in your car, you're saving a couple of bucks. You do that a couple of times a week or several times a month or whatever that is, that actually can add up to savings in your pocket for having the app. Uh, some people will say, listen, our apps are kind of out of control and they're, you know, they're spying on our activity and blah, blah, blah. If you believe all that, you know, probably want to throw your smartphone away and actually go to a rotary phone and uh, stay off the grid as much as possible. Probably not going to watch us on Facebook. By the reality is a lot of these are, you know, they're, they're all tied to that. So uh, anyways, whether or not they're tracking us, right, if you want to save money, you can use these apps. Upside's a great one. Gas Buddy is another great one. Um because gas buddy will show you all the local prices of gas. Now, go into a $10 carton of eggs, but I've never paid $10 for a carton of eggs. So that is insane. Think about yeah, it. Yeah, and that's that's just a supermarket. That's not the warehouse. When you go to the warehouse, you got Sam's Club, Costco, that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, if you pay close to that, at least you're getting a lot of eggs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, right? And so here's the other thing, right? I, I, I think, and I haven't looked at it, but I think that the Costco is probably – you know, their sales have gone up. It's a public company, which probably be able, we should be able to find the information on Costco, what it's what it's done since the pandemic, when people were mm-hmm. home and eating, eating and, you know, buying stuff at a warehouse um, probably saves a lot of money um, because it's large quantity. I don't know. I, I was thinking about like, I'm, I buy stuff at Costco and then I'll think to myself, I'm not, I don't have to come back here for like four months. Like I got so much, so much stuff. At the end of the day, am I ultimately, am I actually saving, you know, saving money? I still think that that's, you know, that's up in the air because you may be saving on a per unit, but I'm buying sizes mm-hmm. of stuff that I probably would never, <laughs> would never go through it forever. It I never buy. It, it, yeah, it depends right? on the item. But um, what we want to do is, so we've just touched on some, some general we're stuff. Talking, we're just talking general economy factors here. Yeah, yes. we're talking general yeah. economy. So, but what we want to do is. Based on our experience as prof- uh, financial professionals, we want to touch on each of the areas that we know are part of the personal financial picture. And this is information that is important to anyone that earns a dollar and pays taxes. And anything that is important to the general public is twice as important to any community that is underserved or marginalized. And that includes the special needs community. And what Brian mentioned earlier, when you think about the definition of special needs, yes, it can be a situation like, you know, Brian, who has an adult daughter diagnosed with microcephaly at the age of three, my son, 16, diagnosed with autism at the age of three. But you're also talking about people that, you know, may have a, have had a catastrophic injury. Um, some people that are the healthiest persons on the planet in their age group, but just because they're advanced in age, are members of the special needs community. If you're blessed with long life, you're going to be a member of that community or caring for someone that is anyway. And so let's touch on one of the first things being short and long-term saving. So before we get into the concepts that allow people to do that, um, why don't you start by letting everybody know, Brian, what we define as short and long-term savings, and then what we do to actually attain those things, especially during um, the economy that we're in right now. Yeah, I think, you know, everybody, obviously, you know, you know, from a, a short term savings perspective, it's 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 where you're putting your money for you for you to access in the immediate. Um, the, the key to a short term savings is having liquidity. Right. So people naturally think bank account. Um, so bank accounts, short term, a CD, for example, would be long term where you're actually locking your money up for a period of time to gain a higher percentage of interest. Long term could be something where you've got, you know, uh, again, you've bought, you make an investment and you're waiting for a certain period of time. It could be something like your retirement, your 401k plan, your IRA, something for the long term, something that you don't need to access immediately, but you're putting money away to, to get at a later, at a later date, whether that later date is a year from now or 25 years from now, it's, it's long term. Short term could include things like stocks and bonds and mutual funds, things where you have a short, you know, you may have a short window, Keep in mind, the thing that impacts your short and your midterm and your long-term savings are the impact of taxes. So short-term gains, whether it's interest or, or, you know, an investment that you bought, maybe you bought a piece of property and you flipped it in this short term within 12 months. Short-term is really considered 12 months or less. Um, You're going to have short-term capital gains on some of that, right? deferred or, you know, your IRA, your 401k, your longer, longer term plans where your tax deferred, you're going to have gains, but you're going to defer the tax. You're going to pay that tax at some point down the road when you withdraw 
when you withdraw your money. So, you know, that's also long term capital gains. That's investment in real estate. That's, you know, again, longer term plans for accessing your money at some point in the future. Uh, so that's that's really the difference between short term and long term. Well, just quickly, while we're on the subject of taxes, we talk about this all the time. Some people say, well, geez, if I, if I they're going to pay the tax now or I'm going to pay the tax later, how do I make the decision of what I need? Well, again, first of all, liquidity is important, right? If I need it, if I need to have access to that money within 12 months, short term is the place to be. Um, if I need it long term, you know, that's where you can defer it. Uh, the other thing is, is if you think about, do you, do you think our tax rates are going to go up in the future? Or are they going to go down in the future, right? We just printed trillions of dollars during the pandemic to go back out to, to families to help support. Who, who, whose money is that? It's all of our money. It's our taxpayer money going into the government and that money coming back out. But the, but we have a, we now have a significant deficit in the country. And so how do we recover from that? Or how do we, and why is that important? By the way, on a global economic scale, just so you know, our deficit is just like a household's, you know, debt and equity. Our deficit impacts the value of our dollar relative to other economies. And so having a deficit, having, you know, owing a lot of debt, the government owing debt, that's problematic for maintaining, you know, equitable value for our currency relative to other countries' currencies. So that's why it's important. How do we help that? How do we change that? You know, we do well, we do it. The government makes the decision to change the tax structure. So the government right. is going to pay for that by increasing our taxes in the future. Sometimes people think, well, should I, is it, is it better for me to pay the tax now when it's low? By the way, Sean, and you, you, you know this, we're at the lowest tax rates in the history of the country, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, yep. and I should, I should, often, I'm yeah. sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to say one thing before we go any further, which I should have said earlier is as you're hearing this and you think financial stuff, especially being a member of the special needs community, especially if you're in a challenge situation and you're looking and you're trying to get by day to day and tomorrow is just something that you're hoping to get through after getting through today. And that, and if you're thinking that, you know, they're talking about money stuff. Yeah. Okay. So now their audience is rich people today or something like that. Uh, -uh. This is for you too, because if you don't have a plan for your money, regardless of how much or how little you make, your government has a plan for it. And it doesn't matter who's in office. And our relationship with money, which is a whole nother thing we could talk about, is based on our experience as we're grown up. We're either in a situation where, you know, uh, you come from an environment where you're well-to-do, so you don't necessarily want for every, anything, so you may have a mindset of excess. Um, if you come from a situation where things are challenging or were financially challenging, you might have a, a mindset of scarcity. If you heard, hey, money doesn't grow on trees. I'm not made of money. And so right. money is, it's been said that money is energy, which is why it's referred to as currency and the mm. energy that we put out towards it and associated with it, how we think about it dictates a lot, you know, about how we earn it, how much we grow and, and everything. So mindset is a whole nother thing. Don't know how much time we'll have to get into that today, but I wanted to touch on that. And if, if anybody feels like they're nodding off because we're talking about numbers and this might shock you coming from two guys that work in financial services um that industry and, and the, those things products life insurance debt elimination all that stuff that doesn't necessarily excite me like at all but what it does for somebody getting them from point a to point b that's exciting 100 percent. that's something sure. that everybody everybody within the sound of my voice should have access to that if the government had its way regardless of who's in office again some of the concepts we're going to share today and that we share on a regular basis would not be available to you, but that's something that we want to change so from everything yeah. from a simple app to actual concepts and terms. So we're talking about short and long-term savings, uh, which you were in the middle yeah. of. Um, yeah. And we're talking about taxes too, because, because mm -hmm. to your point, so, you know, if you think about wealthy families, wealthy families aren't putting their money into savings accounts in the bank, right? Um, they don't because they know that they don't earn any interest. Interest that banks pay today on um, on savings accounts on average around the country is 0.04%. By the way, in Europe, it's negative. It's a negative percent. It actually costs too much. That, that, that's like disinterested. That's not even interest. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. I was like, I'm not, not only am I not interested, I'm actually not, I'm actually negatively interested in what you're right. trying to say. Right? That's, I'm, indifferent. So, I'm indifferent. I'm, I'm indifferent. Yeah, that's right. So, 
So the so so you know that's that's so where are wealthy people putting their money, right? They're putting their money where they can where they can get the better the better rate of return on the money. And so we all should know where wealthy folks are putting their money. Where you know they're obviously if you have access to capital, you can make investments regularly and you can decide what your what you want your returns to be. But wealthy families, well, first of all, let me just say this before we get there are are things in that there's a tax now as we've talked about there's a tax later tax deferred accounts like iras 401ks wealthy people look at those as short-term capital gains and long-term capital gains by the way i'll pay the tax on the gain later down the road um mm -hmm. and then there's another bucket a tax-free bucket tax advantaged bucket there's generally two there are, are a number of financial products municipal bonds for example if you live in the municipality where your bonds are those can be those can be tax free in that municipality. In other words, I live in Los Angeles. If I bought a Detroit municipal bond, that's not tax free to me because I live in LA. It's not tax free outside of the municipality. It's tax free within the municipality. Yeah, and that's then, a good um, piece of information. And the other thing I was going to add is if you're listening to this also thinking, well, look, I have benefits that I receive as a result of my disability, my diagnosis, or my child does. I can't mess with that. That's another thing that's really tricky because there are people that need those funds. And the way that they're set up, they're there to benefit you, but it also kind of keeps you in limbo because you almost become predisposed to not work or to settle or to make sure that what you venture out and get is minimal because you're thinking, okay, if, I re if I'm receiving this money and I need to live on it, if I make any more, then that's going to get taken away. Depending on the state in which you live, there are vehicles and options and products out there where you can grow money um, and save money without having those benefits affected. That's a personal conversation to have offline, but those things exist as well, just for anybody yeah. who's listening and concerned about that. Yeah, every family should be thinking about about this and and take advantage of everything that's available to to everyone. That's why we talk about we talk about wealthy families because sometimes if you're not a wealthy family, you're not taking advantage. Of things. Well, I'm not wealthy. I don't have money. I don't have money to invest. I don't have money to save. So this doesn't this doesn't impact me. But the reality is, it it impacts all of us. Like it does impact you. In fact, again, if you're buying gas at the gas station or eggs at the grocery store, right, you're impacted by by money issues and money matters. Um, and in fact, that, that, that should be it that we can make that the title of, of this episode, money matters. Yeah. And here's the thing, both, both terms for of, oh, that word. some of the things that we've experienced too, if your child is anywhere on the autism spectrum, there's probably certain foods that they are not going to touch. And there's certain foods are the only ones that they will touch. <laughs> So then depending right. on the cost of those goods, you're in a situation. You know, we had a nice breakthrough last night. You know, my wife was eating a burrito. And it's funny, two days prior, we had been saying, you know, we got to get something else in front of Elijah in terms of different foods and stuff like that. Because that can be a challenge. You, you know, you're you're thankful that they're eating. But at the same time, you know, so she's eating a, bur a burrito. And he says, you know, and verbalizes more clear than ever. He says, Mommy, what are you eating? She says, oh, it's a burrito. And he's like, um, Elijah will have one. And so that's his way of not only asking for one, but he proceeded to eat the one that she had. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and, love it. And she had, and she had, it was steak and beans and cheese. And because of the texture of the beans, figured he wouldn't touch. It. He doesn't touch anything mushy. So there's also a lesson there in that you never know. You never know until you try and you never know what your kid's going to do unless you put something else in front of you. But depending on, you know, certain, certain um, items, whether it's, you know, things that you wash your hands with or foods or whatever have you, you know, a lot of our kids are very sensitive to certain things, not just based on texture, but just routine itself. And so that's something else that you got to try and um, get out there and do it, you know, and, and try something new. And sometimes you're forced to do that because the price has gone up tremendously on what it is you might ordinarily get. So that's something else too. Yeah. Well, <laughs> on that, I'll just, I'll just finish the conversation about taxes. Just a complete, sorry. Time. That's okay. Yeah. That's all right. Um, uh, so, so wealthy families look at at tax advantage uh, opportunities, right? So that's that's one thing that we want to let everybody know that there's a that there are there are things that wealthy families take advantage of. We're not paying taxes. First of all, actually owning a business, um, having a business is is one of those things that has a positive impact on your taxes. So, wealthy people do a number of have a number of of activities and habits and, and just part of their thinking one is being a business owner another is having multiple streams of revenue so multiple streams of revenue 
if you're owning a business and you know there's a lot of advantages to to owning a business as it relates to your taxes so the things that you normally spend money on in your day-to-day -day life if you're applying that to your business then that becomes something that you can write off as a business expense and reduce the amount of taxes that you end up paying for example your internet connection at home if you use we're on Streamyard. We'd use Zoom a lot. If you use the internet for your work, for your business, now that internet expense that you paid to have it in your house now becomes part of your business expense. So those are the kinds of obviously talk to your CPA, your CPA will guide you. We're not giving tax advice, but we're giving you I, things to think about as it relates to your taxes. So owning a business, it, having a, you know, a 1099 or having income come outside of your W-2 income, definitely a huge tax advantage. Um, the government says, by the way, through the tax code, the government kind of dictates <laughs> what it what it ultimately wants people to benefit from. And this is going to sound kind of crazy, but think about where tax deductions come from. They come from getting married, you get a tax deduction and getting married. They want you to have children, having children. You get tax deduction for each of your child. They want you to own a house. You can write off a portion of your interest that you pay on your house. Right? They want you to own a business because of the tax write-offs in your business. They want you to tie. They want you to give to charity. Right? Those are the kinds of things that they that they are written in the tax code that automatically give you opportunity to write down your tax exposure through the year. The other thing is there are tax advantage financial vehicles that you can take advantage of. So um, there are really two that are considered to be tax-free. Um, one is what most people think about as a Roth IRA an IRA an individual retirement account. So that's for your future. That's a that's a you know long term plan, long term investment or savings plan. And if you and you're putting post tax dollars into your Roth and you your growth is your your gains are tax free. But some of the challenges is they limit how much you can put in. They also limit how much you can earn in your W two income or actually in all of your income in order to qualify for a Roth. Um, which is interesting because if you make over $144,000 as an individual or over $219,000 as a couple, you don't qualify. So then people think, well, but wealthy people make more than that. So where are wealthy, wealthy people don't qualify for a Roth? Everybody else does, right? A Roth IRA was intended to give average middle America an opportunity to have a tax advantage investment. So where are wealthy people putting their, putting their money? They're putting their money in, believe it or not, cash value or permanent life insurance. So that's one of the things that we talk about a lot. People don't understand life insurance. People think of it as death insurance. There are mm -hmm. certain cultures that don't want you to, don't want anybody to profit from death. So they don't talk about life insurance. But the reality is life insurance is there, is intended, it, it, some people will call it the, um, the Swiss army knife of financial products because it does so many things. It provides, it provides support if you get sick through a long-term care plan. It provides support for your family should you pass away suddenly or unexpectedly. Tax-free death benefit. But the best is if you lead a long and healthy life, your cash value grows like equity in a home or equity in investment, and you can have access to that capital tax-free. So you can access the capital in your, long, in your life insurance policy completely tax-free. You don't have to be wealthy to take advantage of. By the way, wealthy people take advantage of these to the tunes of millions and millions of dollars. It's a way to pass down a portion of their, you know, a portion of their estate to their, to their families uh, tax-free. Um, yep. So those are definitely, you know, adv advantageous, but you don't have to be wealthy in order to have a life insurance policy that builds equity value. So some people say, you know, you put some money in for, let's just say you put some money in for 15 years and you can take money out for the next 15 years completely tax free. So yeah. it's unlike an investment. It's unlike, you know, a, a savings in a, in, a, in a bank account or a CD or something like that. It's something where you can actually put the money in and have access to that money tax free. So so those are the kinds of things that we talk about. So long term savings, short term savings and how it impacts taxes. Um, oops, I'll take that off there. And then the um, here. life sticking insurance, with, smart investments. St sticking with life insurance, too, I wanted to, you know, let people know. First of all, what Brian is talking about when he talks about permanent and being able to grow money and things of that sort, he's speaking specifically about indexed universal life or IUI. Well, but here's the thing. Well, here's here's the thing. I, I shouldn't say he's speaking about that because he's not the only one that does that. Whole life right. allows you to do that as well. But I've seen a lot of the wrong argument taking place when it comes to life insurance. Um, 
people will say, well, you know, what's what's the best life insurance? Term is the only way to go because the permanent stuff costs a whole lot of money. Um, and then people will say, well, the, the, the permanent is better because you can grow money in it. Again, we're here to just share general information and not push one or the other because here's what our firm belief is when it comes to that. The best life insurance product, I'm going to tell you right now, make sure you're leaning into your radio, wherever you're listening carefully. I'm going to tell you what the best life insurance product is. The very best one on the planet. Always has been and always will be. Listening? It's the one that suits the client's needs. It's the one that suits the specific situation. That might be permanent and that might be term. Each situation is different. We happen to offer both. I happen to own both. Each of them has their benefits. There are term policies that have living benefits where, and, and let's back up a little bit for those that are not familiar. Term is permanent for a term, one of anywhere from 10 to 30 years. You pick and choose that time. And there are term po policies that have living benefits that are similar to long-term care, where you have access to funds if you're not able to perform certain acts of daily living, like clothing yourself, uh, bathing yourself, feeding yourself, whether it's illness or injury that takes place. Having something like that is invaluable because to get a long-term care policy that stands on its own is extremely expensive. And I'll let Brian touch a little more on the details of how the index universal life policy works, just because when people think of permanent, they're not usually thinking of that. Permanent policies had a well-earned bad reputation at one point in time because they were expensive and premium, and the rates of return um, that you got inside of the investment portion of it were minimal and you know, like I said, a well-earned bad reputation, but it's been a long time since those things have changed, especially over the last, um, the last 10 years. And there's a handful of different things you can do with that, that again, most people are not aware of. They are mis as misunderstood as they are vital. And when it comes to index universal life, or, or quite frankly, any, I think this might apply to term as well, but even more so with any kind of permanent policy, the policy is only as good as both the competency and the integrity of the agent or advisor that's putting it together. Because the manner in which it's structured will determine how the money grows over a period of time and how it serves that client's needs. So you can go out there and find examples of it being a horrible product for someone because the person that put someone in it, either through intention or lack of experience, just didn't structure it properly. But when it's done correctly, it can essentially be a person's um, um, a person's own pension and has a lot of benefits. For instance, you know, IRAs and things of that sort have limitations as to what you can put in per year. And when the next year rolls around, if you haven't reached that maximum, you can't put the difference in. You've missed out on that opportunity. When it comes to most index universal life products, you have a certain amount that you can put in per year. And let's say you don't meet that max, the next year, whatever you didn't put in to fill that gap goes over to the next year, just like we used to have rollover minutes with um, cell phone service providers. That's just some of the benefits that are there. And Brian can touch on some of the others that exist also. Well, I, did, I mean, listen, we can get into detail. If you're interested, you know, reach out to us on our on our email address at wearejusttwodads um, at gmail. Again, we'll put that up on the screen and we'll put that in the, in the, it's in the, uh, it's in the comments. But but I, I just want to address one of the things that you that you said. Most people think, well, I don't want to buy permanent insurance because it's too expensive. I have I spent a lot of time in the in the investment world. I helped early stage to, uh, companies go go public, and so you know dealt with people who were looking at investments on a regular basis. I don't think I've ever ever in my life heard, read, um, observed anybody ever say. Boy, that investment, um, it, uh, you know, the 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 out the outflow of my me making investment, shoot, that's that's kind of expensive. Like nobody looks at the at the at an investment as a as as a cost. They look at it as an opportunity to benefit them, right? Oh, I'm going to buy. I'm buying the shares. Now maybe they go, well, gee, I maybe I'll buy some Bitcoin. Although that seems like it's a high price today. Maybe I'll wait. Right? There's a little difference in 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 pricing of of that of that investment but the idea of, of putting a thousand dollars into an investment nobody was oh that's that's a thousand dollar expense that's what the challenge is that if people look at permanent life insurance as that's an expense then 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 yes the 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 monthly premium of a permanent policy may be more than a term policy 
but it's the term policy is an expense. Your auto insurance is an expense. Your home insurance is an expense. And we'll talk about that in a second. When you make put money into your permanent life insurance policies, that is an, it, 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 because the equity grows and the equity is there for you to be able to access tax free and the other advantages that come with it. There's value there because your money has an opportunity to grow. Again, whether you're buying whole, universal life, variable universal life, index universal life, there's all of these permanent policies that build equity value. That's the money that you're putting in that you have access to. That's your money. It's not an, it's not an expense. The other thing I was going to say is, is you know, the, the, there was another point that I was going to make about that. But I would just say this, you know, term, term policy. Oh, I know what it was. Here's the thing. Going back to auto insurance and homeowners insurance. Earthquake insurance. Boy, if you didn't have flood insurance in Florida, there, there's, there's, there's a huge impact that that's going to have on those families down in Florida. They didn't have flood insurance. So, so those kinds of insurances are in place in case if you have flood insurance in case you have a massive hurricane come through and it causes flooding, net flooding damages your house. By the way, I have family in Cape Coral. I have family and friends in Fort Myers. Some of them have completely escaped any damage. So they have flood insurance in case there's a flood. In, earth, in California, we have earthquake insurance in case there's an earthquake. You have auto insurance in case your car gets broken into. You get into an accident. Your car gets stolen. Those are – shoot, we buy, we buy insurance on our cell phones in case we drop the phone, we lose our phone, our phone gets stolen. Life insurance is not an in-case insurance. It's not in case you die, right? Life insurance mm-hmm. is not a matter of in case or it's if. It's when. Yeah. It's when. And so if you want to buy a term policy, 10 year term policy, that's not that 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 isn't if you die in the next 10 years, because you could outlive your term policy. In fact, it happens a lot. A term policy is one of the most profitable products an insurance company can offer because because it's you people outlive that that policy. If Mm -hmm. you die, I mean, I got to tell you, if, if I'm. If I'm, you know, 50 years old and I buy a 20 year term policy and I'm healthy and going at 69, my family's thinking, hey, I, I, if this old man lives another year or two, we're out a million bucks. Right. It could be a challenge. <laughs> so term insurance is if you pass away in that period of time. Permanent life insurance is not a matter of if it, it is covers you for when you die. So that's where there's value that people seem to, to miss out. We spend a lot of time talking about life insurance. I'll just tell you this. We just do this from an educational perspective just so people know you can get more information about this. Reach out to us. And by the way, you don't have to talk to us. Talk to somebody who can offer you some help and some support in this area. You Ask some questions. Yeah. Somebody yeah. you trust. Somebody that you – excuse me. Somebody that you know that's looking out for your best interest. If you've got a good you know, person in the financial services arena, they will help you. By the way, one of the impacts that Sean and I – um, are, are looking to do, and we've already made some inroads because we are in that financial services space and because we deal with special needs families. We want to change the way the industry provides insurance policies to special needs families and special needs individuals. We're trying to make a difference in the lives of, you know, in the lives of so many families that we serve by making sure that the financial products that are available are available to everybody, including those that have specialists, those on the spectrum, <clears throat> those with medically complex issues. You know, if we, if you can, if you can insure somebody who's had cancer, you definitely can insure some, you know, a, a child that's that's got Down syndrome. Like it should be covered. There are things that should be handled, should be covered, and that's the stuff. Sean and I have the opportunity to work within the industry to try to make wholesale changes in the industry. Um, by the way, we're always looking for people that want to join in that crusade and help us make make a change, make a meaningful impact in the industry for our families. So reach out to us. Let us know if that's something that's of, of interest to you. Um, and, and we can move we can move beyond beyond insurance now. I will I will tell you um, there are famous. You can look them up. There are famous stories of wealthy people who've utilized life insurance. Um, to, by the way, Walt Disney accessed cash in his life insurance policy to save Disney during the depression. So did J.C. Penney, the Pampered Chef, the founder of Pampered Chef, accessed three thousand dollars from her life insurance policy to start Pampered Chef. There are a lot of companies that exist today because they had access to the capital in their life insurance policies that you will be blown away to know. Uh, again, Leland um, uh, Stan, uh, Stanford, Leland Stanford, 
Cleveland Stamper. Yeah. Cleveland Stamper? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, the, the money from his life and cash value, the equity in his life insurance policy, was able to pay professors during the during you know during the depression to keep professors on board. Stanford University exists today because of life insurance. So, yep. life and that, and those are those are old time. There are new. There are new. Executive bonus new things out, out there, and they both have they both have their um you know again both the term and the permanent have their place for sure. In so most cases, you're dealing with somebody that has one or the other. Whoever you're talking to, make sure they can offer both, and and, and they can provide what's in your best interest. Right, because I was going to say today there are executive bonus programs at Fortune 500 companies that are that are done with life insurance people who have. Business owners who have buy sell agreements that's financed by life insurance policies. There are a lot of there are the use of life insurance today in 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 making financial decisions is 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 extensive. So yeah. uh, yes, talk talk to somebody about it. And by the way, some people will say, "Well, I have life insurance at work, so that should cover me." And I always say, again, it's an if that that works if you plan on dying at work. If you don't, it doesn't cover you. If you leave that job. It doesn't cover you. So because it's their policy. Yeah, the, the, that's another thing from an educational standpoint. I'm glad you brought that up. The employer owns it. So that means that the employer decides, you know, how much coverage you get. And if they offer it, take it because it's it's next it's next to free, it costs next to nothing. Yeah. But the coverage is minimal. You usually have it for as long as you're there. And if it becomes um, a, a financial challenge for the employer and they have to choose between you and that coverage they can have it go away all together. You don't get to decide that. So it's always good to and, have your own. And this is why this is important. We just came out of the pandemic. How many companies do you know shut down, changed their benefits package, made adjustments to the to the compensation that they offer their employees, right? So you don't want to be stuck uninsured. The other thing is, more importantly, for our families, the work that we do for our special needs children, for those of us that are parents, the work that we put into make sure that they're taken care of, that they can live independently, that they can function in the world. Who, how is that covered if you were to pass away unexpectedly and not have coverage? And again, not trying to scare or be, you know, fear mongering. I'm just, we're just, our position is always, you know, we always say uh, tomorrow is many things, but a promise is not one. We are not promised tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how long we're going to be here make sure that you've got something in place to protect your children and protect these systems that exist, you know, that, to, to allow your services to continue. So we yeah. spent a lot of time on, on, on we on did. Yeah. Time. But it, it goes by fast yeah. as always. Um, let's cover a minimal amount of time on, on, uh, on the debt portion of it on, and, and more time on, I think the more common one. So when it comes to, when it comes to, um, a credit card debt. There are a variety of options out there. Uh, there are a variety of concepts out there. There's a concept called debt stacking, whereby you're simply paying off um, the items that have, starting with the items that have the highest interest rate and going, working your way down um, if that's something you can do on your own. If you're looking at something that you're going to um, utilize somebody's services, you might want to consider someone that actually has a debt elimination program versus a debt consolidation program. And the way most of those work, especially one of the, the companies that we work with, what they'll do is you have to be in a situation where, first of all, acknowledge whether or not you're in a situation where you can't get out of that debt based on what you what you you earn. Because a lot of people have decent credit scores, but carry a lot of debt. And that credit score is really super important to them as it should be. But if it is at the expense of being able to live and breathe, you might want to consider some of these programs where you're able to um, have the score go down for a period of time, a predictable period of time, get you out of that debt so that you know when the score is going to then come back out and you come out the other end with the debt behind you. Um, there's companies that we work with that um, that offer that. There are a lot of companies out there that cover that as well. Um, there's also uh, tax debt. I'll make that the shortest in that there's a variety of companies that help business owners that owe tax debt. One of the companies that we work with will, you know, provide that as well. That's something anybody can feel free to reach out to us about. But I think the most common form or the one that's more uh, salient or prevalent right now is student loans. Um, you know, depending on where you fall, you may qualify for forgiveness based on the uh, the program that President Biden has rolled out. Then again, you may not, depending on what your individual situation is. 
Um, why don't you touch on that just a little bit real quick? Yeah, I, I, I mean, here's the thing is there's $1.7 trillion in student loan debt in this country. The average uh, student loan <laughs> is, is over $40,000. While $10,000, you know, a $10,000 uh, forgiveness was great. It doesn't solve a lot of problems. By the way, twenty thousand if you're a Pell Grant recipient, but that doesn't that doesn't necessarily. Eat. I, I I have clients that have hundreds of thousands of dollars in student loan debt. A ten thousand dollar reprieve, while well, great, over the course of the of your lifetime, you, you end up paying that student loan debt well into your you know retirement years. Unfortunately, for many people, um, so the idea that the idea that um, that we you know that that there's a forgiveness program that exists by the way there are some states that are that are fighting it um there are some people who are taking this as a political as a as a political opportunity um mm -hmm. which doesn't make a lot of sense because a lot of folks who who got the ppp loans and they got those forgiven you know in millions <laughs> in the in, in the millions we're talking about a ten thousand dollars so that's but let's just let me just say this there are a number of government um sanctioned forgiveness programs that exist for all student loan borrowers. The problem is that they don't tell anybody about it. So there are a handful of companies, we work with one in particular, that deals with federal student loan debt that can help, that is tapped right into the Department of Education that can help people. Uh, they can look at what their debt structure looks like, how much they're gonna end up paying over the lifetime of that debt and help them qualify for a forgiveness program. So. Those are the kinds of things where, by the way, student loan debt compounds daily. So if you know much about compound interest, you realize the impact of that. Student loans compound daily. And it, and and by the way, if you do a little bit of research into the, the loan service providers, it's it's a uh, shell game. There it's are companies racket. that existed, yep, who, who changed their rules around servicing student loans as of December 31st last year. And then a bunch of other players came in to take over student loan debt. Do not privatize your student loan. If you have a federal student loan, reach out to us. Let us help you refer you to um, to our, our, our folks who help folks with federal student loans. I'm going to just say this in general. We've talked about two things. We've talked about taxes and we've talked about debt. And this goes to a, a kind of a significant position that I always take and Sean feels the same way. The government and the banks are the two institutions that are supposed to serve greater American, all American families. They're supposed to be the institutions that protect all of us. And the reality is both of those institutions protect the wealthy. You know, if you have a lot of money, you'd be amazed at how much, how much you can get in loans at zero interest. But if you don't have a lot of money and you try to get a loan, good luck. In fact, if they charge you credit card interest, your average is 18%. And that is going to be moving up because the federal government just raised the, the, well, I should say the Fed, not the government, the Fed just raised interest rates, which means interest rates on our cars, our homes, our credit cards, any debt is also going to go up. So your cost of debt is going to go up and, and, and the taxes that you're going to pay in the future are going to go up. So where are they giving the breaks? To the wealthy and the affluent and the 1%. So, so those institutions, we talk about taxes and debt because we all need to be in a better financial situation where we're putting money back in our own pockets not in the pockets of the banks through interest rates or the government through taxes. So there are ways to do both legally, legitimately that put money back in your pocket. And that's what we do in our, in our business. Again, we're not selling our services. We just want you to know that it does exist. Help does, does exist. You can be a part of that, you know, solution for your own family. At the end of the day, that's the most important thing that you're protecting your families for our special needs families. They, isn't that crazy how they say that you can qualify for certain benefits, but only if, only if you you limit your earnings to two thousand dollars a year, what does that That's even it's, it's, do? It's completely designed. I'm not, a, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I just know basic math. One on one is two. It's not nine. And what that does, the way the system is set up, it's designed for you to settle. So that's where we had an entire episode just on goal setting and 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 and. and planning and dreams you know they say that people that accomplish the greatest things no matter how much satisfaction they get there's a, a measurably larger amount of dopamine that is released in the system just by the pursuit of something that's worthwhile not even the achievement of it and if you're caring for someone with a disability or special need and you're like look today is what i'm thinking about i've already resigned myself to the fact that i am 
I, I'm trying to get through today. I don't know about tomorrow. It's tough to think that way, but you have to. And it leads us to the next thing, which is estate planning. We will, you know, spend the least time on this, which is perfect because we're not attorneys, but we work with attorneys, one of the largest estate planning firms in the, you know, in the country. And, you know, they happen to work the way that we do, which is that, you know, you don't charge a fee to sit down with someone and educate them. And between the life insurance and the estate planning, again, whether it's us or somebody you know and trust, speak to someone because one must have a plan for a time when you exist only in memory, because that's not a time that may come. It's a time that is. It doesn't matter, you know, don't know how soon, don't know how far away. That's not fun to talk about, but that doesn't make it any less necessary. And just from the layman's standpoint, you know, I'll explain. Most people don't know the difference between a will and a trust. A will is something that, you know, your last will and testament is easier to contest. You have a you have a will, you pass away. If someone decides that they want to contest that, they say, wait a minute. No, Bobby told me that when we were friends or when we dated, he was going to leave everything to me. And the court has to hear that out. That means it goes into probate. Probate can take anywhere from, I have a personal experience of probate myself, to 10 years. And in order to defend the wishes of the departed, the money that is in, uh, that has been left behind, needs to be used to defend against whoever that other person is. A trust is something that's a little more, uh, significantly more binding and, uh, and more difficult to, to challenge. Now, when it comes to a special needs trust, there are a variety of different types. Again, that's one of the ways where you protect um, any benefits that you might be receiving as a result of a disability, um, anything you know, specific in that regard. And depending on each person's situation, there might be a special type of special needs trust. You know, when I sit down with clients, you know, Brian or I, we handle the, the general pieces as far as the debt, the protection, short and long-term savings. I think Brian... I hit that button totally by accident. I apologize. Brian likes the theme, so he just happened to hit it. So that that's, was crazy. What you, that's what happens when you go live. So now you don't have to do it at the I'm end. I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, no, no, we'll, we'll do it at the end. Yeah, that was, I, I meant to put this Glenn Wagstaff thing up, and I hit the wrong button. I apologize, everybody. Sean, sorry, Sean. You, I totally took that. No. Away from you. Hey, by the way, we got to finish up anyways because Sean Hall has already, has already given us a hard time about, about wrapping up here. So, yeah. So sorry. So, there's so a, there's a with variety us. of those. There's a variety of those. And Glenn Wagstaff um, happened to be a guest on our previous episode. He's a, the estate planning attorney that we work with very closely. But I was saying that, you know, I sit down and handle those other areas, but I sit in on the appointments where I've referred Glenn generally. And I've been finding out over the past couple of months, there are different types of special needs trusts and features of those uh, policies that I didn't even know existed. So I continue to learn in that regard. And one thing I would always, I would always say too is that when it comes to um, a, a, a will or a trust, you have to think. Most people don't stop to think. You can create those with as much specificity as you wish, right? So exactly what would you want to take place? And again, this is another one of those things where you're thinking a will. And yeah, that's for rich people. I don't have anything to give to anybody. But you have something to say. You have something to say. There's got to be something you would want to have done, whether it's, you know, small or large. Not, and I'm not talking about in terms of a dollar amount. I'm just talking about in terms of what's important to you. Make sure those things are set so that a plan is put uh, in place. The same thing takes place where it comes to conservatorship. Also, those are not, that's a whole. We can talk. Time. Yeah. And we can talk about these as we wrap this up, just because we could talk about these things. If you're interested, reach out to us. At we are just two dads at Gmail. We'll give you some referrals. We'll, we'll make some recommendations. We can talk through some of these things with you. But I, I don't want to stop you, Sean, but just because we're getting to the end of the show. So, we're there. Um, so um, yeah. So thank you all. Hope you, hopefully you got some value out of this. Uh, again, the economy has impact on all of us. Our finances are important to us. We need to make sure that our families are taken care of. So if, if you have some peace of mind, put something in place to take care of your family. So as we always wrap up uh, the show, I always like to say, first of all, thank you, Sean Hall. Appreciate you. Love you so much, my friend. Thanks for, for guiding us. Um, if uh, love and empathy, right? Be empathetic. You never know what person's situation is that they're going through. Be empathetic, right? Be 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 curious as opposed to judgmental. You never know what somebody's going through. Have some empathy and look at the world through the lenses of love. The world will be a much better place. Uh, thank you everybody for listening in on our podcast, watching us live on Facebook, catching us out back on YouTube, catching us down at WSTX AM Radio. We love you all um, and support you. We'll, we've got a great guest next weekend. Um, next week. So stay tuned for that. So Sean, I'm going to throw it to you to wrap us up here. And then I'm going to hit that button in the right way. 
<laughs> I want to thank everybody for taking the time to tune in to everyone that supported us from day one. Again, like you said, it's been two years, over 100 episodes. It goes by very fast. Uh, and we really are just getting started. We want to impact and change the world, uh, change as many people as we possibly can. And as the great Muhammad Ali once said, you know, um, service to others is the rent we pay for our room on earth. I want to thank my mom and my amazing uh, wife, uh, Laura, my mom, and my mom, Jan, without whom I would not be. Um, everyone, thank you for tuning in. And um, if you're hearing this, we love you. See you next week.